You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ. And Pedro. The flippening is quickening. Updates on laws regarding blockchains. Jack's security hole is working as intended. And video cards that mine crypto only. All this and more in episode 211 here on June 14th, 2017. In traditional markets, we have gold down to $1,261, silver down to $16.88, oil down to $44.73. The Dow is up to uh, 21374 and the 30-year Treasury yield is down to 2.77%. Thanks, Pedro. In the crypto markets, Bitcoin is down to $25.76. Litecoin is up to $30.22. Ethereum is up to $370. And Dash is up to 167 And just a reminder that you can tune into to Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, and more. Well, Pedro, uh, a big week for Ethereum. It actually hit 400 at one point. And, you know, there was uh, a lot of different things going on with Ethereum that we'll talk about. Uh, Bitcoin, it, it hit 3,000 at one point here in U.S. markets, and it, it dropped, and it's still struggling uh, to, to sort of return to that point. Um, mining and GPU cards from AMD and NVIDIA. So AMD and NVIDIA are preparing to launch GPU product lines aimed at mining crypto. After the shelves have been emptied as more mining rigs come online, the GPU giants are looking to create products specifically for mining. They may not have a display connector, and they would not work for video gaming. These cards would also come with a much shorter warranty of 90 days. Yeah, so, because they know you're going to overclock it and run it at high temperatures. So I, I think this is actually a good move uh, because it'll it'll lower slightly the, the cost of the cards. Um, and and in, with s- s- different types of mining, uh, RAM, might not, RAM speed is not as important, uh, depending on the type of mining you're doing. So they can even tailor this to the different uh, mining algorithms. Yeah, so I, I think this is a very smart move, not only to uh, to sat, sate the need of miners, but also to keep their video game customers happy. I mean, I, if I if I wanted a new video card for my birthday, I'd probably have to order it a year ahead of time these days. It's it's tough right now. So AMD stock price in in the traditional market is has gone up a lot uh, because you know AMD cards uh, traditionally have always been far more efficient than NVIDIA cards for crypto mining, although the latest generation of NVIDIA cards have made up a lot of ground, and they're now viable. And in fact, uh, NVIDIA's latest, um, you know, uh, Pascal architecture is actually a very um, efficient with power due to how it's made. So uh, it's a, NVIDIA is actually coming up. They might not have the highest raw hash rate, but the hash rate for the power used is is really good, so it's competitive. So the, um, you know, trying to get a graphics card right now is, is kind of tough if you're going for specific high-end models that are good for a crypto. And this would be much worse if NVIDIA had not made the advances to get their architecture up. Right. I mean, because previously you could only really buy an AMD card unless you wanted to pretty much waste some electricity. So Right. Well, back in the days when I used to do mining uh, on graphics card, it was only uh, AMD at the time. So N- NVIDIA... Did not make any sense at all. Uh, you know, you could you could need to buy two to three NVIDIA cards just to get the performance of one AMD. Uh, they made that up. Um, so this is good because right now, you know, they want to sell those high-end cards to the gamers at high-end prices, uh, but they're tough to come by. Exactly. Well, moving on, proposed update to United States is anti-money laundering obli- obliges uh, anti-money laundering reg- regulations obliges visitors to declare crypto holdings. This is a really strange story here. Uh, Senator Tr- Chuck Grassley has proposed adding the terms digital currency and prepaid access devices to the list of financial items subject to anti-money laundering procedures. It is unclear how this would be enforced, not to mention detected. Pedro, this is pretty uh, draconian almost. It's draconian by people that really don't understand the technology. So my understanding is that if you have, say, a bank account in in Switzerland and it has money in it, when you come into the United States, you don't need to declare that because the money's in the bank in Switzerland. But what they're saying is if it's digital currency, that money's always with you. Okay. Like you're bringing it with you because, I mean, yes, it could be more mobile than money you put into a bank, but... 
No, no, let, let's, let's be clear what they're doing here. So under the guise of, of fighting terrorism, they just want another way to get into your wallet. That's how I see it. Well, and, and that might be the way it is. Uh, well, at the same time, in the European Union, users may be required to link their personal identity to their wallets. This effort is led by the European Commission and Interpol. Wow. Yeah, I did this yesterday. I'm all set. You are? Nice. Good job, Pedro. You're <laughs> complying. Uh, well, there are some good news, though, Pedro. Nevada has protected blockchains with a new law. As of Monday, blockchains and smart contracts are protected in Nevada, and what's more, they can't be taxed. Senate Bill 398 also makes blockchains official records for laws requiring a record and allows local government entities to use blockchains and smart contracts. Nevada joins Vermont as the only two United States that allow blockchains for legal use. So, uh, good news there. Yeah, good news there, and also good news coming out of Illinois. So, um, the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation completed regulatory guidance clarified that digital currency is not captured under the definition of money used in the state's Transmitters of Money Act. The guidance also clarifies clarified activities that are generally regarded as money transmission, including the exchange of digital currency for money through a third-party exchanger or an automated machine. Digital currency businesses whose practices meet these definitions will now need to secure a um, Transmitter of Money Act license. However, other activities such as miners receiving digital currency for verifying transactions, exchanging only between digital currencies, and exchanging digital for currency for money uh, between two parties are excluded from this category, so as long as there's no third party. Perhaps most notably, however, um, it went on to state that the industry startups can use cryptocurrencies as permissible investments, arguing that capital requirements in traditional currencies imposed, quote, added burdens, unquote, on smaller operations. So some good news. That is some good news. It's, it's almost like common sense. <laughs> it's almost like maybe some states are seeing that if they uh, tweak their laws and regulation to uh, advance crypto, that it, it could, you know, bring, bring economic activity to their state. Right. So uh, you have some stories here. Why don't you talk to us about uh, Indian banks? Sure. Uh, Indian banks partner with Microsoft for blockchain banking platforms. So this is from ETH News on June 12th. BankChain, a platform for business for banks to implement blockchain solutions, announced that it has exclusively partnered with Microsoft. As a result, all BankChain consortium members will use it, utilize Microsoft Azure as their cloud partner. Now, I couldn't find in the stories I read about this the details of what blockchain they're going to use. Uh, I do know that Microsoft Azure has uh, blockchain as a service for Ethereum. Um, I don't want to say it's Ethereum at this point. There's not enough information, but we'll stay on top of this uh, and maybe follow up on a future episode. Excellent. Well, let's talk a little bit more about Ethereum right now. And we're talking about the flipping watch. Now, that's not just a sort of a state of observation. It's also a website that is tracking the flipping, if you will, or the, the switch from Bitcoin into Ether. And so this, this it, it tracks a few different metrics here. <clears throat> You know, the market cap uh, transactions over 24 hours, trading volume over 24 hours, mining reward over 24 hours, nodes, and Google Trends. And earlier this week, uh, the flipping had indicated that Ethereum was up over Bitcoin on five of the six categories with only market cap left. Now, it has since changed with uh, Bitcoin has surged a little bit in transactions and trading volume. So, and the, the Google Trends is also heavily in favor of Bitcoin, too, at this point. But it's interesting that there's a website dedicated to tracking this, Pedro. Right. So, I, I think right now it's showing that Bitcoin in the crypto space is, what, 38.5%? Um, and it was, it was way above 80% at uh, beginning of the year. So, you know, things are definitely changing. And I think it's only a matter of time un unless Bitcoin can fix its transaction scalability issue, um, it's only a matter of time before Ethereum and other cryptos encroach on its market cap. Yes. And uh, so I've got another story linked on the blog at neocashradio.com. Be sure to check that out. And the uh, the story is, is related to the flipping, but it explains it in one chart. And what, what we're looking at is a, a chart, a percentage of total market capitalization or dominance. And as Pedro had mentioned, uh, Bitcoin is now down to about 38%. But this chart shows that as Bitcoin has fallen, Ethereum and Dash have, have risen. 
And it's it's like almost at a point of crossover, Pedro. Right. And I think so it's interesting to try to determine what's gonna happen when it does cross that point. Will will Bitcoiners like rush in and, you know, pull Bitcoin back up above above that? Or will this just cause a lot of people to say, well, it really is happening and I'm going to get out of Bitcoin and go into uh, another currency? Uh, that's what's unknown. Well, and, and another thing, too, I've been hearing with the rise of Ether. Now, Ether has just jumped up this last week. Since since our last show, it's gone up. Uh, it, well, it peaked over $140 from last week's show and uh, $140 more than the price last week. And and there's, there's claims, you know, some people... Uh, I've seen talk about how this this is a bubble. Ethereum's a bubble, and I, I, I look at the data that I, I'm I'm capable of seeing from the market, and it seems like rather than a bubble, it's a capitalization. Uh, it seems like over the last week, the top pairings were Bitcoin and Ethereum, or or a fiat currency in Ethereum, and a bunch of fiat currencies ac- occupied that slot. Whether it was Korean currencies, Japanese, Australian, uh, or Chinese, for example. The, the top pairings were Bitcoin or currency and Ether, and the price was going up. This tells me that... There's a lot of fiat money getting converted into crypto. That's right. The, the demand for Ether is higher than the demand for, for fiat. Therefore, you have fiat going into Ether, and you have this massive capitalization of the market. You have both Bitcoin and, and Ether, uh, uh, fiat being streamed in Ether. And in fact, earlier this week... The Shapeshift.io site had a little warning message that they were experiencing an unusually high number of Bitcoin to Ether transactions and that uh, customers should expect some delay in service. Yeah, so uh, some significant delays. And I actually had to do one of those transactions, and it took hours. Uh, It took hours. I thought it failed, i.e., you know, put in a support ticket to Shapeshift. Um, and I got a response from them just as it clear as the transaction cleared. So hats off to their um, customer support. I was very happy with their response. Um, but yes, so if you're going Bitcoin to Ether, right, or at least well, the past few days, um, it's kind of constrained because that's where what a, what they need is a lot of Ether going to crypto to to Bitcoin, and and that's what keeps things you know greased and and going smooth. Right. But, but when you have a dominance of one coin going specifically to another coin. Then that's what can make uh, things diff- difficult because of liquidity. Yes, and there were other issues with the the market this week. In fact, the uh, the banker crowd sale. Let's talk about that. So this was it, it was definitely a historic. The the banker crowd sale goes into overtime. One hundred and fifty three million dollars raised. From the moment the banker token generation event started, the Ethereum network was overwhelmed by transactions. There were a lot of confusion, uh, confused people, in part from a lack of due diligence. Transactions that were sent with a greater than fifty, uh, excuse me, greater than fifty billion way gas price were rejected by the token generation smart contract. In one case, a million dollar contribution was re- rejected seven times due to this gas price detail. In all. 10,885 contributors sent in 396,720 Ether. Tremendous amount. Shortly into the sales start, the banker website was failing to update totals. I was monitoring the situation myself. EtherScan was showing thousands of pending transactions, and Reddit was ablaze with concern. The banker team decided to extend the token sale minimum time to three hours. The network stress also affected the wallet shuffle for freewallet.org, causing more people to panic. So what are they going to do with all that extra money, Pedro? Well, here's the plan. The hidden cap was about $50 million, or 125000 ETH. And they have, quote, we have decided to allocate any proceeds collected in the minimum hour, which exceed the hidden cap, as follows. 20% will be al- allocated to the BNT Ether Reserve to further improve the liquidity of BNT, which increases stability while reducing conversion costs, price slippage, for all. And 80% will be locked for two years in a smart contract that will buy back BNT for 0.01 S. When the initial price, whenever it is available, according to its calculated price. The purchase BNT will then be added to the foundation's long-term budget, and after a two-year period, any remaining S will be allocated pro rata according to the use of proceeds chart and our token creation terms. So, basically, what they're doing is some of this extra money 
when we used to put a price floor on BNT. Uh, now there was a lot of uproar about the changes, the uh, the uh, the changes, in the the terms and contract. Uh, I'm sorry uh, uh, that BNT made during the the token sale and. Maybe this makes up for it. I mean, some people will be at least happy they can get out without losing any money. But I know a lot of there were there were speculators upset that the number of tokens created exceeded what they thought that should be created because that cut into whatever profit that they could have have received by trading them immediately as soon as they were available. So uh, all the all these ICOs and and such are exciting news. Uh, it's a great way to get some venture capital funding for new ideas and, and companies. It's a way the regular individual can participate. But um, in this case, I, I really wish they would have had a more solid, this is how the crowd sale is going to go, you know, and, and kind of carve it in stone. And, and maybe pegging certain number of tokens to one Ether is not a good way to do that if the price of Ether is moving a lot. Um, but I would like to see these ICOs be a little more solid in, when when you go to that crowd sale, you know, uh, coin sale, you know exactly what's happening. You know how many coins, you know uh, a lot, and there's not these last-minute changes. I, I I think that would be healthy for this uh, ecosystem. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, could, I definitely see what you're saying, Pedro, and I think we're, we're sort of in this learning curve of a lot of this is still new stuff, and there aren't really standards or protocols in place yet. Now, Bancorp did try something new, in the the time minimum uh, situation, but um, you know the, the 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 total really it's going to come out and see what happens. What do they, what do they do with this money? And how do they actually invest it and use it? And and what does Bancor become? And hopefully we can get a chance to interview them and and actually ask ask them about that. But, I mean, I I think these uh, these sales are going to have to have some type of cap because what happens when you have irrational exuberance in in the community, in the investment community, right? So let's say a company is going to come out and, they, and they're and they going to have a crowd sale and it's going to go on and they say for a minimum of an hour and then there's no cap on, you know, how many, uh, you know, how much they'll take. Well, what happens if $5 billion goes into this company? And this company is, is you know, nothing more than, say, a dozen developers working out of a garage. Now, you know, they might be able to do great things. I mean, imagine if, uh, you know, in 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 perspective, if that much money was given to somebody like a Bill Gates or, you know, Steve Jobs, you know, they would do great things with that. But that's a lot of money, a lot of capital, and a big chunk of the coin market cap to give to one company that doesn't have a product. And and those are some of the things that concern me. I don't want to see that much money go into a company that has no product and is basically a white paper and a bunch of developers, because if that goes down, then, you know, $5 billion is a lot of money. Yes, so the, the the caps it's it's definitely a a hit and miss thing to to find that sweet spot. Um, in in fact, I had an early an interview, and you can check it on our blog neocashradio.com. dot com. I interviewed Dr. Julian Hosp yesterday, or and published it basically uh, almost this morning, and we talked about their initial token sale where they're selling their pay tokens for the 10x debit card. Check out our blog at neocashradio.com dot com to check out that interview, but. Um, we have a, a bunch more to talk about here, Pedro, and hopefully we can figure out this Bancor thing as, as time goes on. Uh, but moving on, uh, you've got some stories here. Well, give us one. Sure. So uh, Diversified Cryptocurrency Fund is launching from Zug Valley, Switzerland. So on June 12th, uh, from Zug, Switzerland, Crypto Fund AG announced it is launching the Cryptocurrency Fund based on the Cryptocurrency Index to be registered with the Swiss Financial Market Supervisory Authority. The cryptocurrency index is calculated by an index provider known for investing in virtual currencies with significant market caps, including Ether, Bitcoin, Ripple, and other cryptocurrencies. The index's diversification reduces volatility for investors reacting to the surge of emergent currencies in the marketplace, and its growth rate easily outpaces that of traditional equities and securities markets. And that's from uh, ETH News. Wow. Good news there. Um, right, because this, so while it might be difficult to get these type of funds, you know, um, approved here in the United States, mm -hmm. I, I see the, these are going to start happening in other countries, and it's going to be a way for, you know, more traditional currencies to enter the crypto space. 
Yeah, it it sounds like you know the whole diversified fund thing. It's it sounds like something we've talked about before with Prism and with Bancor, in fact. So there are there aren't big investors, wealthy investors, and institutional investors that they they, they want to get into this space, but they are also you know don't want to get into just one blockchain. You know, and one of the reasons is this is very new to them. So you know, as as much as I struggle to keep up in this space. I could only imagine somebody that's new to it to keep up. So I, I think there's definitely a need for a way that institutional money can invest in the crypto market, but diversify um, because, you know, you can see huge swings in, in volatility and, and that scares big investors. So they don't want to see, you know, a crypto go down 20% in a day and think to themselves, well, I'll just wait it out. Um, you know, they don't like seeing that. So diversification is good for this type of investment. Sure thing, Pedro. It's a diversification is good for any investment, I think. I mean, unless you really want to gamble and put everything down on something, uh, you know, which we're not giving advice in buying, selling, or gambling in crypto. Never. So uh, next up, we're going to talk about VX Labs shows how to extract wallet backup phrase on Jack's wallets. In a short blog post, VX Labs breaks down exactly how to both extract the 12-word 12, 12 backup phrase from Jack's wallets and decrypt it. VX Labs claims to have tested this vulnerability on both the Jax Chrome extension and the Jax Linux desktop app. Users have reported upwards of $400,000 lost due to the vulnerability. The response from Jax has been unexpected. They are comfortable with the security model. The CTO Nylong Vias told users, quote, please, 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 if you do not feel comfortable with our security model, do not use our products. We are creating for the masses a multi-platform, multi-coin interface for the blockchain ecosystem where users are in full control of their digital lives, unquote. So, Pedro, this is, I, I mean, is that the response you'd expect them to have? Well, so to be clear, this is for the desktop wallets, right? Yes. Um, not for the mobile wallets. Why would they? Why would they say that this is a good security model. So I thought about that, and the only thing I can come up with is if you forget your password. If you forget your password, they can tell you, go to this location on your hard drive, and here's your seed phrase in plain text, and that's how you recover that. That's the only reason I would see that they would want to keep it in plain text. Well, is, no, it's it's encrypted. The, the seed phrase is encrypted, but you, you, you can find where it's at, and then there's a way to decrypt it because it's hard coded. The the encryption they use is hard coded. Okay. And that's that's where the, the difficulty is. Is there are so many better ways to de- to encrypt things than the way they've done it. Basically, if you have the key, you can decode whatever they have. Well, I thought I read an article that either the seed phrase or uh, the pa- or the the pin number one of those is unencrypted. Maybe I read that wrong. Uh, maybe it was the pin, but. So, I mean, yes, so users, as long as they know about this vulnerability, here's the thing, Jax, if your users know that this is there and they're they're taking a risk with their coins and that they shouldn't, you know, if you make it very, very clear and you keep reminding them you shouldn't keep many coins in this wallet, you know, maybe maybe that would be better. Right, and I I think uh, maybe we don't talk about this enough on the show, but, you know, mobile wallets and, and such are good for small amounts of money, and, and small is, is relative to the individual, but you know, something that if you lost, you'd, you'd be like, well, you know, damn, that sucks, but it's not the end of the world. You should be keeping your significant storage in offline or hardware based uh, key wallets. Yep. Yep. That's the way to do it is, is offline or hardware wallets. That's, that's basically the, the best security that you can currently have. In fact, the best, you know, it's arguable, it's arguable whether the best would be paper wallets kept in a safe because, well, then there are risks with having your things all in one location. Once again, diversifying and, and redundancy is, right. is a good thing. Right. You can place that paper wallet, you know, give a copy of it to a, a trusted family member, a parent, a, you know, a, a brother or sister, uh, somebody you really trust. Um, the other thing you can do is, you know, um, you get an attorney, um, you know, give, you get a multi-sig wallet, you give your attorney one of the one of the signatures, somebody else has the other one. I mean, there's there's various different ways to do it depending on, on how much you have. Now, if you've got millions of dollars in, in crypto, you know, please don't have that on a on a, on a wallet that's uh, on your mobile device. Yeah. Uh, if you have that significant amount of funds, my recommendation is get a few different hardware wallets 
spread that out amongst different wallets, back up those wallets with paper copies, and, and, and spread that around. Because there is no password recovery here in crypto, right? If you, if you lose that private key, you lose the wallet. Well, moving on, we got some more things to talk about here. Dell drops Bitcoin. Dell no longer accepts Bitcoin due to problems with transactions. Specifically, the Dell rep stated that the order processing errors were to blame. And so Bitcoin use, loses yet another vendor. Uh, though I did see some new ones come on board recently, which was a bit strange. But uh, Dandelion, I think it was Newegg, that just recently accepts Bitcoin. Um, and I was like, well, why aren't you accepting like something else? And besides Bitcoin, but uh, maybe they are. Uh, Dandelion for Bitcoin transaction obfuscation. So this is something I uh, found from on GitHub. Uh, quote, Dandelion is a new transaction broadcast mechanism that reduces the risks of eavesdropping linking transactions to the source IP, unquote. So they explain that uh, there are certain, you know, super nodes out there that, that have a lot of outbound connections to nodes, you know, spread amongst uh, locations. And these super nodes snoop for when and where the transaction comes from. And they basically feel like if they can, the, the first node that the transaction is, is sent from is probably the likely origination node, or at least very close to it. So this, this uh, dandelion is a way of uh, basically making it so that it's harder to link up where, which node broadcasts the transaction first and making it harder for you to link that IP to that transaction, which also links that IP to that address, which also links that address to you uh, in most cases, or at least that's what they're trying to prove in a court of law or something like that. So, the, some, the, the, Yeah, this is good to see because we like privacy here at Neocache Radio. That's right. Privacy is really important. So I, I think this is this is great. I mean, th there are other ways to, to do this. If you're more tech-savvy, VPN, um, you can do things like broadcast your transaction by pasting it in so for blockchain.info you can paste a transaction into their website and they broadcast it uh, and you can do the same thing um, with either scan io um, but for your typical you know regular user that doesn't want those extra steps you know these type of uh, products are great yeah so pedro this this you know flipping the price rise just and all of these icos coming out it's it's like a very uh, heady time for crypto, I guess, development or enhancement. Or, or you look at the charts, and this is something interesting. You look at the charts of, like, the price of ether and the the market caps charts, and that that sort of exponential rise of of going vertical is is like right there. You know, it's it's, it's yeah. A, so so I mean, I, I got into Bitcoin back in in twenty twelve. And I thought we would be around this point here, but I thought it would be more gradual. Um, you know, we went through some years where I was like, you know, I don't understand why it's not growing. There's so much potential here. And then it's like in the last six months, things have just really exploded. Yeah. Well, Darren had to take a personal day, but we have our email addresses going. And once again, things are hooked up in the back end of Neocash Radio. So, Pedro, you have an e email address. People can send you an email at... Vorlons no, at no, no no they can send you email at Pedro at neocashradio.com. Oh that's right that's right and then it and then it goes to my Vorlons account. That's right. Um, for the, for those Babylon Five uh, fans out there you'll know what that means. And then Randy uh, you can also send Randy email at Randy at Neocash Radio you can send myself an email at JJ at Neocash Radio and then of course Darren at Darren at Neocash Radio. Uh, also, we have a new support page I put up this past week after last week's episode. So we've got new addresses listed there. We are currently accepting Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and Ether tokens, as well as Dash. And we also have an NXT address that I'm going to be adding to the blog later tonight in the support page. So check out that neocashradio.com slash support. And the show is unsponsored. It is unadvertising. We don't uh, monetize YouTube or anything like that. But uh, please donate, and, and if you appreciate the show, if you appreciate what we've uh, been saying to you and, and whatnot, uh, definitely donate whatever you can uh, comfortably donate, because we really appreciate it, and it will definitely help us to get that market signal to put out more episodes, as I did this uh, last night when I interviewed Dr. Julian Hosp from the 10X Project and the Comet Project. 
So this has uh, been a pleasurable episode of Neocash Radio. Pedro, any last thoughts? Yeah, so before we wrap up, JJ, do you think by this time next week when we do next week's episode, the flippening would have happened yet? Wow. So do I think it would have happened by next week's episode? You're being recorded. I know I'm being recorded. So this is the way the market is shipping up, shaping up. It's It looks like it might happen by next week's episode, but I don't think it will. I think there's going to be some sort of... Uh, I think for whatever reason, Ethereum might bounce against that $400 mark for a little while before it actually breaks through. But once it breaks through 425 450 I think that's when the flipping will really actually start taking hold. And that's just my thoughts based on... Oh, wait watching. a minute. Wait a minute, JJ. Next week is Porkfest. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be there, but you will. I will be there. So how are we going to do the show? Well, I'll, I will definitely be doing the show next week. Uh, and and if if anything else, we'll, we'll have a guest or something. Who knows? There you go. So, uh, my prediction is we will be flipped by you, next you, week. You think we'll be flipped by next show? I'll bet you a soda. Okay. I'll bet you a soda. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to Neocash Radio. As always, check out neocashradio.com. And we're going to definitely have more interviews, more episodes, more of everything. Neocashradio.com. This is JJ and Pedro. And Pedro is still here. Yeah. Yeah.